attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Reaching Jew haters, marrying your computer, and triggering the bodegas. Plus this day in history with the Tehran UFO incident and our song of the day by eBay E on your morning monarchy for September 19th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome back to another listener-supported blast of independent, non-commercial alternative media. Media Monarchy, 12-plus years going strong. Glad you're here. Streaming live, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, Monday through Friday. And it is a Tech Tuesday that means the hashtag is Cyberspace War. All the inner space and outer space news for you today. And of course, all the stories we're going to talk about, you can find at the top of the tweets as well. The invite to the chat. Huge thanks to Jake and Nivik and everybody else hanging out in the chat. Huge thanks to you for taking part. And huge thanks to all our patrons and supporters at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. As we like to say lately, if you can give a little, I can give a pilato. Huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app and also RadioConfluence.com. I haven't thanked either of them in the last several days, if not weeks. RadioConfluence.com, rebroadcast and simulcast all your morning monarchy shows. Hey, and even your daily DJ set at noon, we call Pump Up the Volume. I got a big Tech Tuesday show planned out for you. We got a lot to talk about, so let's blast into the breaking lamestream news. As, of course, Donald Trump threatens to totally destroy North Korea. In his address to the General Assembly just a couple hours ago, Mr. Trump denounced North Korea and its leader Kim Jong-un, saying the nation, quote, threatens the entire world with the unthinkable loss of life as a result of its nuclear weapons program. If the righteous many don't confront the wicked few, then evil will triumph. Trump emphasized that it was against the interests of the entire world for North Korea, which he called a band of criminals, to obtain missiles and nuclear weapons, saying, quote, Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself. So that's what's going on at the big UNGA, hashtag UNGA, the General Assembly. World government, one brick at a time. Hurricane Maria cripples Dominica as it churns towards Puerto Rico. Mueller tightening the screws on Manafort. Oh, that's right. So, they were wiretapped. Everyone, This just in, everyone's spying on everyone, and they lie about it. And we can get it in the chat. Do what I say, not what I do. Action still happens in South Korea. We've been watching that story for a long, long time as everything kind of converges. But let's quickly get our fact check, my friends. Boris Johnson, does his 350 million pound a week Brexit claim add up? That goes to the BBC. Joy Behar claims that PolitiFact says Donald Trump lies 95% of the time. Well, you, you better go to PolitiFact for that. Kroger grocery stores offer free fruit to kids? You better head to Snopes for the answer to that question. Courtney Kardashian wants a baby with young Benjima? figure out what any of those words mean you gotta head to gossip cop and finally speaker ryan's fuzzy math on the nation's terrible tax system you have to head on over to the amazon whole foods grocery store newspaper called the washington compost there's your fact check my fiends and let's now dive into all the inner space and outer space news and again you can find these stories and so very many more using hashtag cyberspace war users of a free software tool again they ain't nothing that's free Designed to optimize system performance on Windows PCs and Android mobile devices, got a nasty shock when Piriform, the com company which makes the C Cleaner tool, revealed in a blog post that certain versions of the hardware and the software have been compromised by hackers and that malicious data harvesting software had been piggybacked on its installer program. Here's a quick heads up on yet another threat to your computer's data. And it's kind of an ironic one as well. If you're a Windows user and have the C Cleaner app, make sure you update it right quick, as a recent version included a bunch of malware. The ironic part, C Cleaner is owned by well-known cybersecurity company Avast. Better known as Crap Cleaner, C Cleaner is designed to scrub web cookies and other digital flotsam from Windows computers. But security researchers at Cisco Talos said they discovered that download servers used by Avast were hacked to distribute malware inside CCleaner. However, Avast is now saying that the 2.27 million users hit by the malware aren't at risk because an automatic update already pushed out to CCleaner killed the virus. So we front-loaded this episode with all the ways that the World Wide Wiretap is listening in. Internet security experts are urging people to update their software in another situation, this time to protect against a so-called serious vulnerability, which, if exploited, could spread uncontrollably via the common wireless technology, strangely known as Bluetooth. 
The so-called Blueborn vulnerability could allow hackers to spread from device to device over Bluetooth without the owner's knowledge. Ty Miller, managing director of international cybersecurity firm Threat Intelligence, said this could be one of the most dangerous security flaws that has come out to date. The vulnerability is considered serious as the researchers who found it say an exploit could spread without people clicking on a link or being on the internet. It's estimated to potentially affect up to 8 billion around the world, and that's because it's got capability to infect Windows, Linux, Android, and iOS devices prior to iOS 10, so the latest iOS isn't affected by the Blueborn vulnerability. More than 5 billion devices could be vulnerable to a eight. new type of Bluetooth attack. And here's the creepy part. To get infected, all you have to do is have your Bluetooth turned on. Researchers at the security company Armis Labs call this newly discovered flaw a Blueborn attack. What makes it dangerous is that to get infected, you do not have to click a link. You don't even have to download a file. It spreads over the air if you have Bluetooth turned on. And hackers can then use an infected phone to spread it to any other phone with Bluetooth turned on nearby. This attack can hit iOS, Android, Windows, and Linux devices. Now here's the good news. If you keep your devices patched with the latest software updates, you should be safe. But the concern is that many older devices won't be getting updates to fix the problem. Armis estimates that 40% of devices that could be infected will not be patched, and that's more than 2 billion devices. As you can see from these demonstrations from Armis, if infected, a hacker can control a phone remotely and turn on the camera to take a photo, or dig through the files to just steal an existing photo. Another demo shows how a Samsung Gear S3 watch can be turned into a listening device, transmitting audio to a hacker without the owner even knowing it. Experts recommend you immediately rush out and buy the new New iPhone 10! Ding, ding, ding. See how that works? The uh, black hat hackers who we pay to, of course, exploit the back doors that we know are in all our software, they've apparently unleashed a new bug that's going to make you have to buy the new latest shit from us. See how that works? God, that almost makes me think of, in a lot of ways, Kids in the Hall. See the skit from the kids in the hall where there's the construction job, but you have to have steel-toed boots. So they basically have the people line up with steel-toed boots, and they test them. Of course, there's people who try and lie about having steel-toed boots. Their feet are smashed by giant steel girders. But the people who do indeed have steel-toed boots, they all get loaded up on the work truck, and they get to go out to the job, which consists of them being taken out into a field, beaten, and have their shoes stolen so that they can go back to the shoe store and sell them again. Does that make sense? You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Tech Tuesday. We call it Cyberspace War. It's September 19th, 2017, and I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. You know, instead of using the iOS backdoor, they could also use the just iOS front door as well. Meanwhile, Chinese, <laughs> Chinese researchers rather have discovered another terrifying vulnerability in voice assistance from... Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung, and Hawaii. It affects every iPhone and MacBook running Siri, any Galaxy phone, any PC running ugh, Windows 10, and even Amazon's Alexa Assistant, using a technique called the Dolphin Attack. Man, I love those guys. Can't wait to hear their new record. Using a technique called the Dolphin Attack, a team from Xijiang University translated typical vocal commands into ultrasonic frequencies that are too high for the human ear to hear, but perfectly decipherable by all the microphones and software powering our always-on voice assistants. This relatively simple translation process lets them take control of gadgets with just a few words uttered in frequencies none of us can hear. Researchers from China's Zhejiang University just found a way to attack popular voice assistants like Siri and Alexa by sending commands in ultrasonic frequencies. That may sound crazy, but it is a simple technique hackers already use, and the researchers just published a paper on it called Dolphin Attack. They even made a video of it so we can watch and freak out. Those frequencies cannot be heard by humans, but not so for the microphones in your smart devices, as you can hear by the faint blip of Siri responding to its command right here. 
The researchers tested phrases call 123-456-7890, open dolphinattack.com, and open the back door for smart locks. And you'll see from this chart the nefarious commands worked on 16 devices and 7 systems total from Samsung phones to Alexa devices and iPads. All those attacks would leave owners vulnerable to data or real-life attacks. It was even able to change the navigation on an Audi Q3. I need to stress this hack only worked to a range of about six feet, but if you're in a public place with your phone unlocked and Siri or Google Assistant enabled, a nearby attacker could probably use it. For now, the researchers recommend device makers either modify microphones so that they do not accept signals above 20 kilohertz, or simply cancel any voice commands at inaudible frequencies. One last hacking tidbit. You might have seen our story about targeted US and European power grids because Symantec just reported that a group called Dragonfly is currently targeting those sectors with the intention of learning how those facilities operate. They've even taken screenshots of operating panels, according to Wired. Now, did you catch buried in that audio report? And again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes, all the audio, all the video, all the articles, all the research. Oh, yeah, by the way, it totally worked on hacking an Audi car as well. Let's just move on from that. So there's the updates on all the devices are crappy and we shouldn't buy them. Alexa, order me a dollhouse. Ooh, and some cookies. One week after what may be the biggest security leak in U.S. history, when Equifax belatedly admitted that hackers made off with over 143 million private data profiles, sending the company's stock 37% lower in the past week, you'd think it would actually be more, leading, of course, to a massive scandal which will go through at least one round of congressional critter hearings in which company CEO Dick Smith... We'll have to explain why the company waited for weeks before making the unprecedented data breach public, a breach which came due to a vulnerability the company was aware of and should have patched months prior, by the way. If that sounds vaguely familiar. And will likely culminate with prison time for one of its, one or more of its company executives. Questions have emerged if Equifax was involved in another cover-up, this time involving the background of its chief security officer. You know, kind of like how Homer's in charge of safety at the nuclear plant. Let's meet Susan Malden. M-A-U-L-D-I-N. Malden. The Equifax Chief Information Security Officer and the person who was responsible for keeping the highly confidential and secret information of over 100 million Americans, well, confidential and secret. Malden has been with Equifax as CSO since 2013. She previously was Senior Vice President and Chief Security Officer at First Data Corporation until 2013. She was also SunTrust Bank's Group Vice President from 0709. So far, so good. But a problem emerges. According to, don't forget, Microsoft bot LinkedIn, Malden's stated educational background has no security or technology credentials and consists of a bachelor's degree in music composition. Ooh, magna cum laude, and a Master's of Fine Arts degree in music composition summa cum laude, both from the University of Georgia. Once again, that sounds like somebody I wouldn't have mind going to music or communications school under. But this was the person in charge of keeping hundreds of millions of people's personal and financial data safe, and whose failure to do that have put 143 million at risk from identity theft and fraud. Or rather, it's what her LinkedIn profile would have disclosed if in the hours after the scandal broke, somebody didn't thoroughly scrub and censor it. As Market Watch's Brett Ahrens writes, there's been a very little coverage so far of Susan Malden's background and training. Given the ongoing disaster of the hack and Equifax handling of the fair, the media spotlight has so far been elsewhere. It now emerges that someone was very keen on keeping as little information about Malden's background in the public domain as possible. Shortly after the Equifax scandal broke, Malden's LinkedIn page was made private and her last name replaced with an M. Kind of sounds like a Fritz Lang movie. Zero Hedge has all the screen grabs, all the stuff, all the links, all the things. Pretty obvious. Hell, let's go to HollywoodLANews.com, which reported in March 2016. Malden was interviewed on camera by the CEO of big data company, Kazina. And this is all in the background. 
The full interview videos went far in explaining what may have been the eventual cause of the massive leak of information now gravely affecting 143 million Americans. Now, of course, you know, I'm not going to be the one to make fun of anybody involved in music. Just perhaps maybe in the wrong field. Now, if it comes out that she had four years of modern dance and three years of tap, then she is screwed. Hey, would you like to market Nazi memorabilia? Or perhaps recruit marchers for a far-right rally? Well, guess what? Facebook's self-service ad-buying platform has the right audience for you. Until this week, when CNBC asked Facebook about it, the world's largest social network trap enabled ad advertisers to direct their pitches to the news feeds of almost 2,300 people who expressed interest in the topics of, quote, Jew hater, how to burn Jews, or history of why Jews ruin the world. To test if those ad categories on Facebook were real, CNBC paid 30 bucks to target those groups with three promoted posts in which a ProPublica article or post was displayed in their newsfeed. Guess what? Facebook approved all three Jew hater ads within 15 minutes. The special counsel investigating Russian meddling in last year's presidential election has obtained through a search warrant records of Russian linked ads posted on Facebook, some by inauthentic profiles. That disclosure, first reported by The Wall Street Journal and CNN this weekend, follows a story published Thursday by ProPublica that revealed how Facebook advertisers could target ads specifically at anti-Semitic users. Yesterday, NewsHour Weekend's Hari Srinivasan spoke with one of the authors of that article, ProPublica reporter Julia Angwin. Most people don't buy ads. How does ad buying work on Facebook? So the way it works on Facebook is you go in and you say, I want to buy an ad, and they offer you all sorts of options. You can do it by age and by the city, and you can even do it by the zip code. You can type in some thoughts like, I want people who listen to Bon Jovi, or I want people who are yeah. uh, really into Woo! nose rings, or whatever you are interested bon in. They will tell you how many people they think they have like that in their system. So what did you guys do? Somebody gave us a tip that there was a category called Jew haters. So we went in and we typed Jew hater and they were like, cool, there's 2,200 of them you can target. And mm -hmm. we thought, really? So we bought an ad because we, we thought maybe there would be an approval process like where it would, wouldn't go through, but then it went through. And then we thought maybe it was a bug, so we bought another one and it went through. And then we thought maybe it was really, a, maybe that was crazy. So we bought a third one just to be sure which yeah. went through. And then we decided that they did have an ad category called Jew hater. You know, there's a screen that you have on your story. As you're doing this, you see all of these other sort of almost suggested yes. categories. Right. So when you put in Jew space H, it suggests for you Jew hater, um, how to burn Jews, um, <laughs> why Jews ruin the world. Jew hats. Uh, and uh, it suggested other things that were related. Their top suggestion was the Second Amendment, which would be related. Are these phrases or categories that people have assigned to themselves or? Yeah, it seems as though what happened here is these were described as fields of study. And so it seems as though people had put in their profile, their field of study was these things. Everything you write in your profile, where you fill out your interests, your movies, whatever, it just they just automatically turn it into an ad targeting category. You know, companies in the in the Silicon Valley have often said, "Listen, it's not our job to censor." But that's not necessarily what Facebook said when you confronted them with this. Yeah, you know, they could have actually said, "Look, live and let live," but they actually didn't. They took it down. They took down the categories that we mentioned, but then they actually took down all self-identified categories. So they said, you know, we need to figure out how we can sift through these to make sure there's not other stuff in there. So how is this even fixable? I mean, there's no way that humans can sit there and look at every type of ad that every company across Facebook wants to buy. It's a big data problem for sure, but you know what's interesting, if think about the big data problems Facebook has solved effectively automatic catching of every nipple, <laughs> mm. um, automatic photo tagging of all your friends' faces, right? So I feel like I have faith that if they tried, they could also figure out some big data algorithm solution to this one. I'm just not sure that they had tried. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the money at stake here. I mean, even if they shut this spigot off just for the few days or few weeks yep. until they solve this problem, this is, this is serious money. Yeah, I mean, Facebook, they have the most, you know, advertising dollars of anybody in online. And that's because of this collection of all these teeny tiny micro segments. And so when you add up all their little micro segments, it's going to be significant revenues, whether it's 1% or 2% of their revenues. It's still big numbers. It's almost as if Friendface is facilitating anger and division. It's almost as though that's part of their mission statement. Hmm. 
we've talked nearly every week about secret psychological operations Facebook ran on their users, which of course that you're being used, to see if they could emotionally manipulate you. Manipulate you, And yes, indeed they did. And indeed they can. There's a lot to break down in there. And a lot of fantastic reasons to delete your friend face accounts. Also, of course, gun owners are, of course, automatically Nazis. So essentially, friend face is fine to do all this stuff without you knowing about it. They know that, unfortunately, a large section of the internet are a bunch of assholes. Have you ever looked at YouTube comments? No offense, my YouTube commenters, you're perfect. <laughs> They're fine to do this without anybody knowing about it. But of course, as soon as CNBC says, you know, you approved three of our Jew hater ads, they go, oh gosh. I guess we better act like we care while we're raking in bajillions of dollars, letting the Russians in. So what do we do about all this? Well, banning social media trolls from voting could help reduce the amount of abuse faced by politicians. An election watchdog has said, we're now hopping over to The Guardian. So now we're, I believe, across the pond with different types of selections. The Electoral Commission says legislation around elections should be reviewed and new offenses could be introduced. In the commission's submission to a committee on standards in public life inquiry into the intimidation of political candidates, officials say many offenses under electoral law date back to the 1800s or earlier. They say some electoral offenses can result in an offender being disqualified from voting or from registering to vote. Such deterrence could be considered to stop abusive people. In some instances, electoral law does specify offenses in respect to behavior that could also amount to an offense under the general criminal law. It may be that similar special electoral consequences could act as a deterrent to abusive behavior in relation to candidates and campaigners. Ban social media trolls from voting, an election watchdog says. Electoral Commission says bans could be considered an attempt to reduce amount of abuse faced by politicians. A BBC survey has found that 87% of MPs, members of parliament, say they experienced abuse during the 2017 general election campaign. Half, 51% of the MPs who responded to the Radio 5 Live survey says it was the worst election campaign they had experienced in terms of abuse. I mean, I just want to make all your decisions and go live in the capital and keep my dirty paws in the trough. Why all the abuse? I just want to lie and cheat and get you to vote against your best interests constantly. One Labor MP said someone had threatened to bomb her office and another MP claimed to have had a bottle smashed on me. The anonymous survey received responses from 113 of the UK's 650 MPs. A Downing Street spokeswoman said Theresa May viewed the abuse and intimidation of candidates during the election as unacceptable. She asked the Committee on Standards on Standards in Public Life to have a look at that and we'll see what they come back with. More generally... I think what she would say is that there's a clear difference between legitimate scrutiny and conduct that is fueled by hate and personal abuse. And as our buddy Ray Vahi says, I'm, I'm so shocked, shocked on many levels, so shocked and surprised that they would threaten to take away, not my vote. It's all I have. As you know, a lot of people are getting excited about voting harder. Man, you're going to have to vote. Let's vote harder in 2018. That's going to really change things. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy, and in our ongoing coverage of the Awan Brothers, it's the latest installment. Mysterious case of Imran Awan. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, now indicted, former IT staffer. Of course, it continues to grow more interesting by the day, let alone by the week. As has been noted before, Awan and his wife, Hina Alvey, have so far only been charged with bank fraud and, of course, that classic conspiracy. Though new allegations of wrongdoing seemingly surface on a daily basis. Now, would you like the latest revelation? Comes via an exclusive report via the Daily Caller, which has been tracking this big time, suggests that Emron Awan may have been fired only after Capitol Police discovered a 
secret server being housed by House Democratic Caucus. Luke Rosiak is an investigative reporter with The Daily Caller. Is an explosive report out today about Debbie Wasserman Schultz and her former IT staffer. Now, Rosiak reports that, quote, exclusive DWS IT guy was banned from House after trying to hide the secret server. Luke goes on to explain in the article, quote, now indicted former congressional IT aide Imran Awan allegedly routed data from numerous House Democrats to a secret server. Now, Fox News has not been able to independently verify this, but if that is true, well, that is beyond damning. Here with reaction, Fox News anchor attorney Greg Jarrett, Circa News, Sarah Carter. Greg, if that's true, to me that means one thing, that there's a chance other countries could have been fed this information that the security concerns we had may be real. Absolutely. I mean, he was downloading huge quantities of sensitive documents to a secret server. And that puts a lie to what Democrats, including Debbie Wasserman Schultz, have been claiming all along that there were no security breaches. Clearly, there were. Uh, it, it also suggests to me that this is a guy who probably is planning to flip, to implicate Democrats who are either wittingly or unwittingly complicit in his criminal activities. Why do I think that? Because his wife, who is safely ensconced in Pakistan, has now reportedly yeah, decided back. to turn herself in to American authorities. Now, she wouldn't do that unless an immunity deal was in the works uh, to implicate people like Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Now, did Democrats, no. did, did Russians actually hack our systems? A senior investigative official said, does it mean this guy sold the information to the Russians? I don't know. So, Sean, they're clearly looking at whether a Democratic insider is the one who gave the information to the Russians, not hacking you know, at all. And, and add to that, Sarah Carter, that uh, Imran Awan actually took Debbie Wasserman Schultz's computer, left it in a place with a message for law enforcement here. It's all here. Um, I got to believe De Debbie Wasserman Schultz. I think I think that plea deal is coming. She's in trouble. Well, I have to believe something is coming because not only did Imran leave her laptop sitting there in that small room uh, at the Rayburn office building, but he left a letter for the U.S. attorney. He left copies of his identification sitting all around. I mean, Luke was very detailed in this story on how this happened. And just like Greg said, uh, Sean, these are huge national security implications. Imran A1 and his wife, Hina Alvi, they moved data apparently, you know, if the story is true, from protected servers of members of the House Intelligence Committee, House Foreign Affairs Committee, to an off-site server that was connected to the House Democratic Caucus. And that could have been established right there. They could have put it within the server that's connected to the House Democratic Caucus, created a back door where they could infiltrate that system whenever they wanted. And not only that, he created a Dropbox account where he put everything into this Dropbox account, where he could access wow. it after February 2nd, when he was removed. And all of his trips to Pakistan for months at a time and having armored escort in Pakistan has to raise the suspicion that possibly Imran Awan and his wife, Hina Alvi, are connected to Pakistani intelligence. All right, we're going to stay on the story. Nobody else in the media will dare touch it. I promise you we're ahead of the curve. Where did you get this? The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Indeed, you are listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm your host, Webmaster DJ, and so very much more. James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. 12 plus years and going strong. You know, it seems like those hacks on TV have sure denigrated the meaning of the word hack. Probably because they're a bunch of hacks. And we're all just waiting. Waiting with our held breath at just any moment. Julian Assange is going to swing into the rescue, right? WikiLeaks is going to blow them all away. We are all really excited because I'm sure this is just, they're all going to get the justice. It's coming soon. I can feel it. I mean, look, Alex Jones is streaming right now. Total vindication of Trump! Exclamation marks. Meanwhile, we're independent, non-commercial alternative media 
called Media Monarchy. We've never jumped on any bandwagon. You've never heard of totally flip everything we believe 180 and start to do something else. We might not be the best, but we do our best. One person knows exactly who leaked the DNC emails. He has said repeatedly on record that it was not a state actor and not Russia. Julian Assange can blow apart the entire Hillary Clinton concocted Russiagate witch hunt, and yet Assange has not been questioned by any U.S. investigator. We're getting the story from the Duran. Representative Dana Rohrbacher, repug out of California, did decide to meet with Assange, hologram or not, and has now moved the ball forward by meeting with White House Chief of Staff John Kelly, who you might also know as a military general and the head of Homeland Security. So just don't worry about, you know, having the military in control of your government. Don't worry about that. Dana Rohrbacher, John Kelly, talking about a potential deal with Julian Assange on the WikiLeaks Podesta documents. Gateway Pundit reports Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller, who of course involved in the FBI, Anthrax, which we're going to hear a little bit more about. I, hell, I've even got a Bon Jovi sync coming up for you a little bit later on this episode. Gateway Pundit reports Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller, who is investigating whether America's next top president colluded with the Soviet Union during the Cold War election, refuses to speak with Julian Assange. The Duran speculates it might be because he's afraid of what he may find. California Republican Representative Dana Rohrbacher spoke to White House Chief of Staff John Kelly last Wednesday about a potential deal with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in exchange for info that exonerates Russia of hacking allegations, this according to a dumping day report from the Wall Street Journal. They said Rohrbacher spoke with Kelly in order to strike a deal in which the U.S. would drop the probe. California Congressman told the D.C. Daily Caller, that Assange, who promises never to reveal the sources, told Rohrbacher during their August meeting that he could prove that Russia wasn't behind the hacking and dissemination of emails from the Democratic National Committee during the 2016 election. U.S. intelligence has pointed the finger at Russian intelligence services for the DNC email link. Kelly told Rohrbacher that he should go to the American intelligence community with his proposal. He said, she said, purple monkey elephant. Turns into a twisted game of telephone. Now, I already get in trouble for saying that Julian Assange was a part of the family, the Australian LSD cult. The chat is saying, Snowden's a hologram, his glasses are broken in every picture. It's that little, it's the little nose pad, which, you know, anyone that wears glasses knows you would never have that on your nose. It's very uncomfortable. I pretty much stopped buying glasses that have the detachable nose pads. I just want them attached. Plus, it's easier to push up on top of your head, and it won't get tangled in your long, luxurious hippie hair. Facebook and Google will soon face increased levels of U.S. government regulation because they're effectively the same thing, I would editorially argue. But this article from the IB Times says they've effectively evolved into surveillance states believes a leading Silicon Valley venture capitalist and former social media executive, Chamath Palihapitiya. Chamath Palihapitiya, leading Silicon venture capitalist, Palihapitiya, CEO of Social Capital, and a former friend Faye staffer told CNBC this week, on the 14th of September to be precise, that Amazon is instead a much much better investment opportunity because it's modeled on consumption and currently operating in the most unconstrained market. He was discussing the topic of FANG. F-A-N-G. I think we've got a new acronym, friends. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. FANG. Are there fangs in your neck? Are there fangs in your family's neck bleeding you dry? The regulatory overhang is much higher in the case of Facebook and Google than it is for Amazon. Amazon is a microscopic portion of global consumption today, so ultimately, I think it has more room to grow before it invites regulatory overview. On the other hand, Facebook and Google are effectively surveillance states. They have so much personal, private information about so many citizens of so many countries, they have to deal with some very sensitive issues. Palihapitiya said companies like Friendface and Alphabet are constrained by an ad-based model and noting that holding on to so much public data could become a real issue. 
they are running an ad-based model, and occasionally it gets them in trouble when they run afoul of the powers that shouldn't be, which are essentially revolving door. The CIA-connected drug smuggling gang in the book Inherent Vice by Thomas Pinchon was called the Golden Fang. And as long as we're talking about Jeff Bezos, Whole Foods, Washington Post, Amazon, they already account for about a quarter of all online sales in the United States. In the past few weeks, Amazon has started to buy scores of small television channels. Several major program providers confirmed to NBC News. A rep for Amazon declined to comment, but hinted there will be much to say in the coming weeks about its efforts in online video. Amazon ain't just hungry for your fake news and your fake food. They want your fake TV, too. Currently, subscribers to Amazon Prime get TV, movies, and music, as well as free shipping on online purchases. They can also pay extra for premium channels, such as HBO and Showtime, along with a host of niche interest services on the topics, such as health or horror. Which are pretty close. As traditional pay TV providers scale down their offerings into cheaper so-called skinny bundles, Amazon is looking to scoop up smaller TV channels with minimal distro in order to build itself into a video destination for every imaginable niche with a particular focus on millennial audiences. Many networks have channels like these, including Turner Broadcasting's Adult Swim and Boomerang or Viacom's VH1 and CMT. They are doubling down on the channel's business. Now let's kick it into Overdrive here as the last 10 minutes of headlines on the Cyberspace War edition of Your Morning Monarchy. The Mountain Brook, Alabama man has made national headlines over the years for filing several federal lawsuits regarding his desire to marry his computer. Said he's on a mission to preserve the integrity of my constitution. Mark Chris Sevier filed a lawsuit in Alabama's Northern District last month stating his rights, along with several ex-gay co-plaintiffs, were violated by Governor Kay Ivey, Attorney General Steve Marshall, and Blount County Probate Judge Chris Green because Sevier's marriage to an Apple computer, which he claimed to marry, of course, in New Mexico, was not registered or recognized, rather, in Blount County. In the filing, Sevier, or Sevier, claimed he, quote, married an object in New Mexico with female-like features, end quote, and asked Green to either recognize the union or issue him a new marriage license. Defendant Green issues marriage licenses to individuals who identify as homosexual, but he refuses to issue marriage licenses to zoophiles, machinists, and polygamous license based can only be described as procedurally arbitrary. The Mountain Book native told AL.com he still partially lives in Alabama, but spends time in Paris, New York, D.C., and Hollywood, you know, of course. He attended Vanderbilt University for his undergrad in politics and also attended Vanderbilt Law School. He said then he ran a record company in Tennessee, was an officer in the U.S. military, and worked on overseas humanitarian cases. Sevier, seems like you need to kind of focus your, your intentions here. Seemed to be a little bit of a dilettante nutball. Mountain Brook native fights to marry computer to protest the charade of gay marriage. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of Papua New Guineans have been without electricity for the past two days because of an electronic payment system glitch. Hey, don't worry. Don't worry about Apple Pay. Don't worry about putting all your eggs in one basket. They'll be fine. They'll be totally safe. They won't get hacked at all. Papua New Guinea powers prepaid Easy Pay, E-A-S-I, P-A-Y. Easy Pay system failed on 9-11, leaving customers unable to top up their accounts. The company promised to have the system restored by midnight on 9-12, but failed to do so. Those customers with limited credit spent the time without power to their homes. Yolandria English said the outage spoiled the food in her family's freezer. Our cleaner's trying to throw out all our meat because the electricity has been out for like two days now. The prepaid power is usually purchased on mobile phones or from shops. Ms. English and her one-year-old daughter spent the time outside trying to keep cool as the fans and air conditioning could not be used. I can't cope up with the fact that PNG Power doesn't have a backup system in play. It's just unrealistic. Payment system glitch causes widespread power outage. And as we say in a lot of ways, past his prologue. What could possibly go wrong when you tie in your electricity with an electronic payment system? 
Meanwhile, Netflix has Narcos actors threaten to shoot the families of French people for pirating the show. Speaking of French, first just take a moment to drink in that 2017 headline. It's a weird time to be alive. In any case, you've likely heard of Netflix's hit original show, Narcos, which we've reported for you here on The Morning Show. The show follows the exploits of government agent Pablo Escobar's drug organization and was once the subject of Escobar's brother demanding a billion dollars from Netflix over the portrayal. That's, I think, the news we brought to you. Netflix, of course, was the disruptive new streaming service for movies and television that has since decided to go the route of copyright protectionists now that it's producing its own original content. It's a strange look for a company that exploded on a model of convenience over piracy, raking in tons of legit dollars by simply being a better option than or comparable to pirating films and television. Rather than continuing to compete in that area, the company has begun to go the way of big content, firing off all kinds of DMCA notices. And now threatening to shoot people and their families for pirating Netflix content? Well, not really, of course. I'm sure the Netflix folks thought it would be funny to have actors from Narcos do so in character in France. The video, of course, now is unavailable, unsurprisingly. Hopefully somebody got a copy of this. If you got a copy of it, let me know. James at MediaMonarchy.com. The nice summary, though, from Torrent Freak. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Do you think you're smart? Do you think we didn't see you Googling Narcos Season 3 download? Don't be a fool. Narcos is a business. If you want your entertainment, if you want your show, you're going to pay the Cali Cartel. Do you think we're like the Hadopi? Do you think we're going to send you a nice, polite letter first? Please, sir, madam, could you not illegally download Narcos? We don't do courtesy letters. This is no please, no por favor. There's bullets for you, your family, and all the people you send to watch Narcos on all those shitty websites full of questionable pop-ups. You don't know where to find us. Don't mess around. There you have Netflix threatening to kill people who pirate shows. And that's how it goes. That's how the trap goes. Interesting article, and again, we've gotten a lot of interesting stuff from our buddy Nathan in the land down under. He sends us a lot of stories from the ABC, that's the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, who's got an interesting bit about the video game industry, transitioning from a group of backyard innovators to an industry of multi-billion dollar companies, hiring psychologists, neuroscientists, and marketing experts to turn customers into addicts. The latest trend is the creation of whales. People so addicted to games that they spend their entire life savings to keep playing. But the video game industry, today of course one of the fastest growing industries in America, has more humble origins in the 18, 1980s and 90s. It was just backyard hobbyists. Ah, I remember King's Quest. But now it's basically dudes who used to work at Microsoft and now create Half-Life. The article is called The Business of Addiction, How the Games Industry is Learning from Casinos. Another interesting piece, of course, from Muckrock. They claim five good things the CIA is responsible for. Number five, pacemakers and breast cancer screenings. Number four, Google Earth. Number three, Halo for Mac. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Number two, the Paris Review. And number one, J.J. Abrams' career kind of gave us one away with a header image on this article from Muckrock, but ABC's Alias was indeed produced with the assistance of the CIA's film industry liaison, and they were proud enough of it to use Jennifer Garner in their recruitment material. Did you ever go to the movies and see Jennifer Garner doing an ad for the CIA? I mean, it does really balance out all the heroin and crack and running and terrorism that they do. The success of Alias helped showrunner J.J. Abrams bring you Lost, and then all those new Star Trek movies, and then all those new shitty Disney Star Wars movies. Yes, video games, the Paris Review, art, all of it. Sticky, ugly, gross fingers of the CIA. Hey, speaking of the CIA... Alphabet Incorporated, you know, the owners of Google, they're in discussions with Lyft about a possible investment in the ride-hailing company, potentially deepening an existing partnership between the two firms. An injection of support from one of Silicon Valley's largest companies could be a boost to Lyft as the number two ride provider battles rival Uber for a little bit of market share. According to a person familiar with the situation, Alphabet is in discussions with Lyft about a potential investment in the ride-hailing company. This could potentially develop an existing partnership between the two firms. 
More support from one of Silicon Valley's largest companies could boost Lyft as the company battles rival Uber for market share. It is not yet immediately clear how large an investment Alphabet could make. Bloomberg reported there was at least some discussion of a $1 billion deal. Speaking of the powers that shouldn't be in the military-industrial complex that likes to masquerade as entertainment slash your government, Northrop Grumman to buy missile maker Orbital ATK for $7.8 billion. We file that under further murders and executions. And we head on up to Wisconsin, where the Wisconsin Senate approved nearly $3 billion in cash payments for the Foxconn Technology Group. The $3 billion Foxconn deal clears a new hurdle as a local community drops out of the running to land the potential economic engine. Kenosha is out, leaving Racine County as perhaps the lone potential landing spot for Foxconn and the thousands of jobs expected to come with it. Rebecca Clough just returned from a scene where officials were tight-lipped about what could be a windfall. George and Carol, all the action tonight happened behind closed doors. No one would comment on camera, despite Racine County being the only location left in the state Senate approving a $3 billion incentive package. So we'll have to drop that there. The clip actually does go on, and we've been following the story about Foxconn, because you've heard of Foxconn. That's the depressing, soul-crushing job that uses rare earth materials to build your little fondle slabs, and that's where lots of people commit suicide working on that stuff in China. So all that stuff coming soon to Wisconsin. Giddy up. Our final story, I've got to give also the short shrift because we've got to wrap up this episode, but it is the perfect way to end our Tech Tuesday Cyberspace War stories and transition into Wednesday's Food World Order stories with two ex-Googlers who want to make bodegas and mom-and-pop corner stores obsolete, and it's called Bodega. It's a startup that installs unmanned pantry boxes in apartments, offices, dorms, and gyms. It promises convenience, but also represents competition for many mom and pop stores. And really, the list of angel investors alone is enough to make you go, nope to that bodega. In just one day, this pantry box company seems to have become the country's most hated startup. Bodega, an automated retail box, uses cameras and an app to record and charge customers for purchases. The company plans to take on traditional convenience stores and set up shop near offices, apartments, gyms, and college campuses. Two ex-Google employees developed the service and unveiled it on Wednesday. Within hours, it garnered criticism and anger on social media. Critics railed against the quote, glorified vending machine for its potential to undercut actual bodegas and gentrify neighborhoods. Defenders of the physical stores argue bodegas are about community as much as convenience. The company founders address the concerns in a blog post saying they don't intend to put corner stores out of business. Elaborating on that point, they write that corner stores, quote, offer an integral human connection to their patrons that our automated storefronts never will. But real bodegas are struggling due to the rise of chain stores and rising rent. The New York Times reported about 75 stores closed in New York City between January and August 2015, most of them in lower income areas. Would bodega worsen that problem? Probably not. The Verge notes that if the company just marketed itself as a vending machine competitor, it might have avoided the backlash. Even beyond the outcry, critics still argue the service is unnecessary, overcomplicated, and out of touch. Engadget compared Bodega to Juicero, a startup selling $700 juicers that juiced bags of juice. That company shut down earlier this month. Bodega, in the meantime, is still running in the San Francisco area with plans to expand. I'm um, sure plans to expand up here in peak Portland. They also secured angel investment from senior executives at Facebook, Twitter, Dropbox, and Google. And yes, much like Disney tried to trademark the phrase Dias de la Muertos, Day of the Dead, for their new movie that they were going to call Day of the Dead, they of course were sent packing, and that new movie is out now and it's called Coco. And yes, it's kind of like those community fridges and blessing boxes that we've talked about for several years. It's just like that, except it's got the new overlay where it costs things. And it's filled with a bunch of corporate-owned chemical garbage. I mean, the pictures on this thing. You can see the pictures of, ooh, you mean that's where I could get my Tide dishwash? And other garbage chemical products you should not have in your fridge, let alone your medicine cabinet. That will transition us into tomorrow's Food World Order news. That's your Cyberspace War September 19th news. And again, 
I always implore you, those are just the 10 dozen or so stories that we picked out. There are many, many, many other stories using the hashtag for each and every day. If you're into technology and cyberspace war news, just follow that hashtag and you'll find all kinds of news. If you're more into food, health, and environment, food, world, order. We've got brand new music from the French Cuban band called eBay E. That's I B E Y E. And I, I don't think they're being sued by eBay yet, but we'll get more on that at the end of this episode. But first, let's stroll down this day in history. September 19th, 1796, George Washington's farewell address is printed across America as an open letter to the public. 1881, U.S. President James A. Garfield dies of wounds suffered in a July 2nd shooting. Vice President Chester A. Arthur becomes president upon Garfield's death. Of course, Chester A. Arthur's what gave Lisa the Chester arthritis. I think I might be screwing up that Simpsons quote. <laughs> However, the interesting part about now mentioning Garfield, we just talked about... Um, who, who was it? It was McKinley last week. McKinley and Garfield both died ostensibly by assassin's bullets, but what they really died by was their idiot doctors introducing infection with their grody fingers that they poked in both of those guys trying to find the bullet, which they didn't. That's pretty well documented that both McKinley and Garfield are martyrs to medical malpractice. September 19th, 1952, as we jump to the 20th century, the United States bars Charlie Chaplin from re-entering the country after a trip to England. He's on that travel ban. 1957, the first American underground nuclear bomb test as part of Operation Plum Bob. And on this day in 1970, the very first Glastonbury Festival is held on a farm belonging to Michael Evis, as it still does to this day. That same day, Kostas Georgiakis, a Greek student of geology, sets himself ablaze in the Mattiotti Square in Genoa, Italy as a protest against the dictatorial regime of Greece's Papadopoulos. September 19, 1973. 26-year-old musician Graham Parsons dies of multiple drug use, morphine and tequila, in a California motel room. His death inspired one of the more bizarre automobile-related crimes on record. Two of his friends stole his body, stashed it in a borrowed hearse, and drove it into the middle of the Joshua Tree National Park, where they dashed it with gasoline and set it on fire. That's Graham Parsons on this day. September 19th, 1974, Max Weinberg makes his debut as the drummer for the Boss's E Street Band. 1976, two Imperial Iranian Air Force F-4 Phantom II jets fly out to investigate an unidentified flying object when both, independently, lose instrumentation and communication as they approach, only to have them restored upon withdrawal. It's called the Tehran UFO Incident. Unsealed case file. The Tehran Incident. Tehran, Iran. September 19th. 1976. In September of 1976, in the middle of Tehran, Iran, uh, an airbase there was receiving quite a few phone calls about a mysterious object that was seen hovering over the city. Iranian Air Force generals scrambled two American-made F-4 Phantom fighter jets to intercept. But just as the first pilot realizes that the object is unlike anything he has ever seen before, his controls mysteriously shut down. He is called back to base and the second F-4 takes a closer look. As it got the same amount of distance as the first plane, something different happened. A second UFO appeared from the first one. Then all of a sudden, the second UFO jetted forward towards the incoming F-4 Phantom jet. So the next thing that he does is he arms his AIM-4 missile, flips the switch, and he's gonna fire back. He goes to fire in three, Two, one, everything shuts off. He has no control over the fire. He sees an incoming object and he can't do a thing. The pilot fears for his life and takes evasive action, throwing his plane into a dive. As he's seeing this object come towards him, again, assuming it was a missile, before it impacts his craft, it makes a dip, it loops around his aircraft and rejoins the original UFO. As pretty much to say, I don't think so, don't even try it. The UFOs maneuver in a way that defy any known aircraft capabilities of the time. There was actually a third UFO that appeared as the pilot saw it come out of the side of the original craft, then goes towards Earth and actually lands on the ground. 
It says to have cast a large light about a third of a kilometer in diameter on the ground. American officers are secretly dispatched to Tehran, where they conduct a lengthy interview with the Iranian pilots, officers, and air control personnel. The report is sent to top-level agencies within the U.S. government. I've never seen a UFO document be forwarded that widely. The CIA, the NSA, the FBI, and again, even the White House received a copy of this report. Why does the U.S. government take such an intense interest in the Tehran incident, seven years after the Air Force said that studying UFOs does not further scientific knowledge? Obviously, if a UFO can disable a fighter jet in Tehran, it can do it in the United States. Does the government take it seriously? Absolutely. This proves beyond a doubt that the UFO phenomena was real. This proves beyond a doubt that they were still interested in it. And this proves beyond any doubt that this was technology that we don't even have today, decades later. Was it swamp gas? Was it a weather balloon? Was it the same UFO that Jimmy Carter saw? Or does it just have anything possibly to do with, you know, the Shah still being in power? The Tehran UFO incident, this day in history in 1976, continuing to look at this day in history, September 19th, 1982, Scott Fallman posts the first documented emoticons, that's the smiley and the frowny, on the Carnegie Mellon bulletin board system. 1985, a strong earthquake. Oh, were there any earthquakes this morning? I believe there was a 3.5 in LA this morning. On this day in history in 85, a strong earthquake kills thousands and destroys hundreds of buildings in Mexico City. That same day, Tipper Gore and other political wives form the Parents Music Resource Center as Frank Zappa, Dee Snyder, John Denver, and other musicians testify at U.S. congressional hearings on obscenity in rock music. September 19th, 1988, Erasure's A Little Respect was released. Also, Bon Jovi released their album New Jersey on this day in 1988. Looking for fans of Bon Jovi? September 19th, 1989, a terrorist bomb explodes. UTA Flight 772 in midair above the desert in Niger, killing 171. September 19th, 1995, the Washington Post and the New York Times both publish CIA-connected Ted Kaczynski Unabomber's Manifesto. That's right, continuing their long intelligence connections. And finally, September 19th, 2006, the Thai military stages a coup in Bangkok. Constitution revoked, martial law declared. Published a media monarchy a decade ago today, China's ultimatum, let us invade Taiwan or we'll dump the dollar. Christine Ebersol stands up for 9-11 truth. And finally, was Israeli raid a dry run for an attack on Iran? Those stories published a media monarchy a decade ago today. And celebrating birthdays on September 19th, author of The Lord of the Flies, William Golding. It's also Frances Farmer. She has had yet to have her revenge on Seattle, but she's still working on it. Helen Ward was born on this day, famed singer. James Lipton, he's still alive. He turns 90 today. It's also Nick Massey, bass player and singer for the Four Seasons. And the late, great Adam West was born on this day. It's also would have been Brian Epstein's birthday. Bill Medley, he's still kicking it. Cass Elliott would have been born on this day. Actually, she was still born on this day. She ain't celebrating it anymore. Jeremy Irons, Twiggy the Model, the ubiquitous Nile Rodgers. It's also Lita Ford's birthday, Mario Batali, Sherry O'Terry, Jarvis Cocker from Pulp. It's also Soledad O'Brien's birthday, Jimmy Bauer from I Hate God and Super Joint Ritual, Monica Crowley, Candy Dulfer, Jay Electronica, and Tegan and Sarah, the Quinn Twins. Some of those folks might weasel their way into our daily DJ set at noon, but to wet your whistle... We got your song of the day, Electronic Soul Sisters, E-B-E, I-B-E-Y-E. Integrate elements of their French-Cuban background and Yoruba culture into their music. Their new LP, Ash, is coming out September 29th, and we've got the new single, Away Away from E-B-E, thus concluding the Tech Tuesday Cyberspace War edition of your Morning Monarchy. It is Tuesday, September 19th, 2017, and I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Again, thanking you so much for taking part. And reminding you, as always, my friends, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.